Please provide a warm Winnipeg welcome for Dr. McMaster. John, thank you very much for uh, your very generous uh, and um, welcome and, and also grateful to the, um, to the Dean and others for the kind of welcome I've received over the last few days. Um, getting here was a bit of an adventure um, between cancellations of flights in, in, in Chicago, but uh, one eventually did make it, and even though my baggage did not arrive until sometime last night, but I stand before you fully clothed and in my right mind. <laughs> and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I, I've been grateful for the hospitality shown to me over the past uh, few days, and I will take back to Ireland uh, many happy memories of this occasion. Um, I'm privileged to be invited to um, share this lecture with you this evening. Uh, I count that a very great honour. Uh, I'm somewhat relieved that I'm competing only with a financial presentation. Um, and the sound has gone. No, it hasn't. It, it, it's still here. Uh, and, and, and Dr. Bracken has just gone to get me some water because, because I'm Irish and I do about two pages to the litre. <laughs> but I'm privileged to be here and um, I hope that this lecture can make a valuable contribution in some way to what is a very rich and long tradition that you have with this annual affiliation lecture. The theme I was given, or at least not exactly the theme, but it was suggested that the focus should be an interfaith focus, an interfaith dialogue focus. And so the theme that I've chosen for the, the lecture is recovering an Abrahamic peace ethic for a threatened planet, the 21st century global imperative. While we do live in a world of many faiths, in fact, one world with many faiths, and a major challenge of this century is to find a way of sharing the planet that is peaceful and enables environmental and human flourishing. The 21st century will need to be characterized, and I suspect it will be characterized, by neighbor religions and dialogue, and that dialogue will be ethical dialogue. This century, I think will be a century of dialogue and ethics. The imperatives around this will be at their sharpest in relation to the Abrahamic faiths, not to the exclusion of other faiths, but because the peace of the planet, it would seem, is most threatened by the relationships between Jews and Christians and Muslims. There are potent religious dimensions to the whole Middle East conflict region and to the intractable wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and the imperative is both local and global. The Abrahamic traditions are challenged in another particular way to dialogue towards ethics, and this is because of their family connections. Like Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland, where I'm from, this too, I think, is a, an intra, is intra-religious dialogue. Abraham is a shared ancestor in faith, the primal root from which these three faith traditions have grown. They share a primal and common story, share Abraham as parent, and from this beginning they have each developed, tragically often in opposition, their monotheistic faiths and strong prophetic and ethical traditions. But then family feuds and quarrels are always the most difficult to resolve and sometimes do seem intractable. Nevertheless, the shared heritage means that there are shared ethics and values and there is need to recover a shared peace ethic in a world threatened by environmental and human suffering. Indeed, the extensive planetary suffering within the community of life is, I believe, the starting point for any Abrahamic reflection on God and the recovery of a peace ethic. So I would like to look at two dimensions to the Abrahamic encounter, beyond ethical dysfunction and the essence of an Abrahamic peace ethic. So let me begin with beyond ethical dysfunction. Each of these faiths often in opposition 
to each other, suffers from serious ethical dysfunction despite the claims to be ethical religions. The two dimensions I want to mention in this. One is what I have called mutual supersessionism. Historically, I think Christianity started it uh, rather early in its story. Some would say that supersessionism started as early as the Gospels of Matthew and John. Supersessionism is the belief that Christianity has superseded Judaism, that the Christian church has replaced the people of ancient Israel as the people of God, and that the covenant God made with the Jews has been negated, and the new covenant is now between God and the Christian faith community. It is the promise fulfillment model by which Christians read the Hebrew Bible as a book that promises, predicts in some interpretations, the coming of Christ, and that the Gospels and letters are read as the fulfillment of these promises. It is the Christian reading of the Hebrew Bible Christologically, read through the lens of Christ. And so, it was Christians who invented the terminology of Old Testament and New Testament to refer to the two parts of the Bible. And the New Testament, of course, in this view, supersedes the Old. The Old is fulfilled in the New. This Christian supersessionism might also be described as a superiority complex. And like most, if not all, superiority complex, complexes leads to seriously dysfunctional relationships. Matthew's Gospel can be and has often been read from the supersessionist perspective. One of its key motifs is the word fulfillment. This was written to fulfill the words of the prophet. And if prophecy is understood as prediction, then fulfillment is taken as supersessionism. John's Gospel has frequent references to the Jews, which sounds like pejorative references. And the Jews appear to be responsible for the death of Jesus. Generations following have read Matthew and John in this way. Parables or stories of Jesus are stories told by Jesus, such as the vineyard owner who sends a series of rent collectors, all of whom are beaten and tortured, and who then sends his only son who is killed, and so the vineyard owner himself comes and kills off the wicked tenants. Christian tradition has identified the rent collectors with the Jewish prophets, the only son as Jesus and the killing of the wicked tenants as the punishment of the Jews for rejecting Jesus. Now, the brutality and violence of God in this reading, who is the vineyard owner, does not seem to have raised any ethical or many ethical or moral questions. It has not occurred to centuries of... Ah, it's all right, don't worry. I'm booming, am I? Gives me a chance to... Thank you. I hope you'll be back. <laughs> it has not occurred to centuries of Christian interpretation that this reading of the Jesus parable is, in fact, ethically dysfunctional. And God, too, in this reading is ethically dysfunctional, even obscenely so. Were Matthew and John supersessionists? And when Jesus told stories, was he too supersessionist? What was crucial and overlooked in traditional and often later interpretations of the Gospels of Matthew and John was that the Gospels do not reflect a Christian-Jewish conflict, an inter-religious conflict. Rather, what was being reflected was a conflict between Jews who were reading their shared faith narrative differently. There were at least 22 different reform movements within Judaism at this time, and dispute and conflict between them was commonplace. The early followers of the Jesus movement were Jewish followers of the Jewish Jesus. What was reflected in the Gospels of Matthew and John were expulsions of these Jews from Jewish synagogues by Jewish leaders, and these were tense and conflictual standoffs, and they were intra Jewish disputes. 
Furthermore, these Gospels were written within the generation that experienced the catastrophic Jewish-Roman War of 66-70 CE. And the Jewish Jesus movement, in line with prophets like Hosea and their Jewish teacher Jesus, were critical of violence and practiced active nonviolent resistance. In the bitter aftermath of a crushing war that would have exacerbated tension and conflict between the different Jewish camps of which the Jesus movement was one. Now, as for the story of Jesus, if the all pervasive foreground to this story or parable we've mentioned is recognized, then the dominance of imperial Roman militarism and oppressive economic domination, then the parable is a radical critique of the utter futility of violence as a means of resisting imperialism and all that it leads to is a spiral of totally destructive violence. This kind of contextualization of the gospel texts and stories has been overlooked by much of the Christian tradition. I do not highlight these more contextualized reading strategies to excuse any anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism in the Christian foundational documents, but to offer a more critical interpretative strategy to the centuries-old supersessionist reading. Now, if the Gospels of Matthew and John and parables like the one of the vineyard owner are reflective of, of an intra-Jewish conflict and radical critiques of imperial violence and Jewish resistance movement violence, then post-war a growing and more non-Jewish Christian movement developed a very different reading strategy. By the next Jewish-Roman violent conflict in 135 CE, when the Romans crushed the Bar Kokhba revolt, the separation of synagogue and church was complete. It was at that point that the new Christian movement turned its back on Judaism, rejected its Jewish roots, lost its character as a Jewish messianic reform movement, and became a non-Jewish, specifically Christian movement, superseding Judaism. And by the fourth century, when Constantine Christianized the empire, Jewish-Christian relations deteriorated further. Constantine's successor, Theodosius, not only made Christianity the only legal religion of the empire, but in doing so made Judaism illegal. Jews were now blamed for the death of Jesus and persecuted as a result. Judaism, having been superseded by Christianity, it was argued, had no reason or right to exist. Now, this was ethical dysfunction writ large, and it continued through the centuries as anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. In the 15th century, Jews were expelled from Spain. The ghettos of Europe were created, and the ultimate ethical dysfunction resulted in the Holocaust or Shoah of the mid-20th century. Christian supersessionism in history has had catastrophic consequences, and is an ethical dysfunctionalism which post-Holocaust Christianity needs to exorcise. Supersessionist theology or ideology is shared. Islam was born in the seventh century and within a very short time was being understood, at least by some, as the final revelation of God through the final prophet Muhammad. Now from this perspective, not only has Christianity superseded Judaism, Islam has superseded both Judaism and Christianity. And from the 10th century, there has been constant assertion of the absoluteness of Islam in some quarters as the only true and perfect vision of Abrahamic monotheism. One text from the Quran has been frequently cited in support of this exclusivist or supersessionist claim. Quote, for if one goes in search of a religion other than self-surrender to God, it will, be, it will never be accepted from him. And in the life to come, he shall be among the lost. Now, like all texts in the Quran, it is interpreted. And one approach to these texts has been to claim that the revelation of God in Judaism and Christianity has been set aside, abrogated by a later one, namely, namely Islam. As with Christianity, this is one interpretation. Others would suggest that the Quran is silent on supersessionism. 
Yet a claim is made that the primal revelation has been falsified and distorted by Jews and Christians, but this does not mean that the validity of these revelations is completely disputed. But even the claim to falsification sounds like a total truth claim and very easily becomes exclusivistic. There are perspectives also in Judaism, especially Orthodox Judaism, that at one time did not recognize Christians and Muslims as part of the Abrahamic family, as not belonging to the covenant. Because Judaism came first, this, I suppose, is not supersessionism, but where it is held is making the same kind of claim as Christian and Muslim supersessionism, an absolute and exclusivist truth claim. There are those in Orthodox Judaism who have moved from a position of the exclusion of Christians and Muslims from the covenant. But the commandeering of Abraham by any one of the religions, or the monopolizing of Abraham by any one, does tend to dysfunctional relations and a dysfunctional ethic. Each of the Abrahamic faiths in the 21st century not only need to dialogue with each other and together, each needs to critically examine and be prepared to critique their traditionalist, absolutist truth claims. Is there really a peace ethic and a peace praxis if each of the Abrahamic faiths insists on making final and totalizing truth claims resulting in a superiority complex or supersessionism? And are not, are not, absolute truth claims a bit of a human invention rather than revelation of the divine. And our very humanity should help us to recognize the limits of human knowledge. One function that has been said of the transcendent is to humble us, to remind us that our thoughts are not the thoughts of God or the great goddess or whatever, to remind us that at least for the time being we see through a glass darkly. The second issue I want to look at under the ethical dysfunctionalism is religious violence. The Abrahamic religions have a history of violence inspired, it seems, and legitimized by religion. The new atheists such as Dawkins, Harris, and Hitchens have a field day listing all the ways in which religion is a toxic evil in the world. They easily appear to have history on their side. It is not difficult to cite the Crusades, the Inquisition, the conquest of America by Columbus and the Church, 9-11, Northern Ireland, Israel-Palestine, Kashmir, and so on. Religion is a toxic poison. And their big argument is true, at least 50% true. It is true that religion is one of the greatest forces of evil in world history. It is not, though, the whole story. Quote, religion is also one of the greatest forces for good. Religions have put God's stamp of approval on all sorts of demonic schemes. But religions also possess the power to say no to evil and banality. Yes, religion gave us the Inquisition. Closer to our own time, it gave us the assassinations of Egypt's president, Israel's prime minister, India's prime minister, but religion also gave us abolitionism and the civil rights movement. Many, perhaps most of the world's greatest paintings, novels, sculptures, buildings, and musical compositions were also religiously inspired. So I suppose religion is both toxic and tonic, and because it is both the 21st century problem and challenge is not secularism, but the role of religion in civil and political society. And since the Abrahamic faiths make up half of the world's population, it is not only a case of what the other half will make of them. It is whether or not the Abrahamic faiths will be toxic or tonic to the planet. The toxic contribution needs to be acknowledged and the mystique of religious violence and war critiqued and deconstructed. Nationalism and national leaders live by the principle very often of blood sacrifice or the supreme sacrifice for the cause. To kill and to be killed 
which is betrayed as noble and heroic is only pos possible, or at least politicians seem to believe, is only possible when justified by the highest moral power of religion and its God. Every empire in human history has been about guns, gold, and God. And God, it seems, has been essential to the guns and the gold, or substitute oil. This is why God is invoked in war and violence and on memorial days and occasions of state remembrance. In the midst of problems rooted in land, oppression, discrimination, or any number of other historical grievances, religion is often called on to justify human violence with subtle and not so subtle references to sacred texts, divine mission, or moral purpose. Now, the Abrahamic faiths have a particular challenge to deal with the sacred texts which appear in the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Testament, and the Koran to literally advocate violence, justify it, and authorize it by God, or are interpreted by adherents in ways that lead to divine authorization. All three writings have texts of terror or of violence, or which have been interpreted as such. And they cannot be avoided because they have been used to justify historic killings and acts of violence, not just against humans, but also against the environment. Sometimes the divinely authorized violence is rejected on the basis that those who carried it out, the Oklahoma bombing, religiously inspired assassinations of political leaders, the crashing of planes into the Twin Towers, these were not carried out, it is sometimes said, by real Christians, real Jews, or real Muslims. Well, that may be a very disturbing kind of get-out clause, which fails to understand and makes no effort to understand the way in which, for example, Nazism was fueled by the ancient Christian hatred of Jews as Christ killers. Or the terrorists whose faith turned jets into weapons of mass destruction, who left Korans in their suitcases and shouted, God is great, as they bore down on their targets. We cannot, I think, absolve ourselves so easily from responsibility for the dark shadow side of our respective religions. There is a large part of the Abrahamic faiths and religions which is toxic. And every time it is allowed by the silence of its adherent or their adherence, or the private allowed by the privatization and spiritualization of faith to spread its poison, we are part of the toxic and ethical dysfunction. That's the end of the bad news. We we change we change the focus to the essence of an Abrahamic peace ethic. Each of the Abrahamic traditions has a peace ethic. There are texts of violence, even terror, especially if literalized, but there are also texts of peace. These toxic religions also have the capacity to be tonic to the planet, especially through a peace ethic. Claiming Abraham as a common parent not only provides shared origins, a common rock from which each tradition has been hewn, it also opens up the possibility of recovery of the essence of an Abrahamic peace ethic. Now, this, this is not a simple back to Abraham campaign or the search for the historical Abraham. Neither is possible because each of the faiths will read their Abrahamic narratives in the light of present needs. And we do well to read the narratives or the storylines in their ancient cultural and socio-political contexts, and the storylines will inevitably be read in contemporary contexts. It will also be inevitable that the readings will contain bias. As for the historical Abraham, he will be elusive. And if we think we have found him, it will be a delusion, a looking probably at our own face in the mirror. But historicity does not ultimately matter, and the 21st century may well be escaping from its scientific straitjacket into a new appreciation of the power of myth and mythology. 
The Abrahamic stories are probably closer to myth than they are to history, perhaps better described as theomyth or even mythoethics. Four things to highlight. Abraham is a model of faith. Now, the Abraham story is a story in Jewish, Christian, and Islamic traditions, the story of a person before God. Living before God is portrayed not as legal observance, nor as legal and religious achievements. Abraham, in the storyline, is addressed by God, called, summoned, lured, to move out beyond familiar surroundings, to leave the comfort zone, and to journey into an unknown future without maps. Abraham experiences a big ask. The big ask reoccurs when in the Judeo-Christian storyline, he is asked, it seems commanded, to sacrifice his son Isaac, and in the Muslim story, it is to sacrifice the other son Ishmael. Now, whether or not this story is intended to help a faith community put an end to child sacrifice, even blood sacrifice, it is a story of Abraham's yes to God's ask. Now, there are ethical questions here about God and violence. And God's demand is violent. And ethical religions have got to wrestle with that. Abraham is portrayed as saying yes to God's ask in this part of the story and in the opening part of the story. Faith is not rules or regulations or adherence to a system of doctrine or ritual. It is the human yes to the divine. It is dedicated trust, the willingness to be open to a future, and to follow without maps and destination signs. Each of the Abrahamic religions can tend towards formalization and systematization. The practice of religion becomes adherence to legal and ritual requirements. Ideas lose their power as ideas and become formulations requiring intellectual assent. But this is not the Abrahamic story. There is an unknown and unknowingness about it. The leaving of Ur of the Chaldees becomes the paradigm for being human. Being human is being on the way to God, the incomprehensible mystery, the unknown future. Ur human, if that's how we may refer to Abraham in the story, breaks with oppression and the domination system, moves out of imperial and hegemonic existence, social, economic, political, and religious. This is what leaving Ur of the Chaldees means. Openness to a new and a different future, the unknown future of an unknowable God. Now, this may be closer to Jewish, Christian, and Islamic mysticism in terms of Islam closer to Sufism and the poet Rumi and his gamble everything for love. The Quran does describe Abraham as a man of pure faith and no idolater. All three religions are monotheistic, but all three use many names to describe God. And perhaps the mystics more than others have realized that ultimately God is beyond names and beyond knowing. Judaism does not name God. Christianity has its apophatic tradition. The most we know of God is that we do not know. Islam and the Quran asks questions without answers and declares, let the Lord be your quest. And so Abraham is the model of faith as quest, as journey, as living with questions and the unknowing, leaving behind the unjust, oppress oppressive, dehumanizing past for a different but unknown future. It is dedicated trust in God's future, surrender of the human to the divine mystery to become more human on the journey. The ethic is rooted in the experience of God and the life quest, always into unknown, often unmapped territory, and that is the quest to live ethically in a world of nationalism, consumerism, xenophobia, religious fanaticism, exclusivism, and violence. A second highlight in the story is Abraham and the shared covenant. In the Hebrew Bible, the key storyline in covenant and Abraham is in Genesis chapter 17. This part of the story belongs to the priestly theology of Abraham. It is written in all probability by a school of priests out of the catastrophic experience of exile in Babylon. 
Now here are theoethics or mythoethics written to challenge exiles faced with the challenge to leave Babylon and return uh, to Jerusalem. So Abraham before God, surrendering, surrendering to the call to leave the old and journey towards the unknown new is the existential and experiential model for returning exiles. A covenant is at the heart of these priestly theoethics. The word is used 13 times in Genesis 17 and hardly used at all in other parts of the Abrahamic narrative. The distinctive thing about the priestly narrative is that the covenant is bigger and beyond Abraham from generation to generation. It stretches out into the future and there is an inclusivity about it as well as being what is described as an eternal covenant. And Genesis 17 is also the narrative in which Ishmael is signed with the covenant and Ishmael having huge theological significance in the Islamic narrative. So the story of Abraham and covenant is a root story for all three religions. It is true that each of the three religions entered history at different times and in very different cultural and historical contexts. From a shared root story, they developed theologies and practices, often in conflict with each other, not least in violent conflict. Globalization, whatever else it means in terms of economic and cultural hegemonic domination, is also about unprecedented encounter and ethical challenge to the Abrahamic faiths. Now, covenant is a word that is used in all three sacred texts. In the Hebrew Bible, it is a radically alternative vision of society to the one that has been shaped by imperial domination, its militarism, and its economic oppression. Covenant is a radical socio-economic ethical vision, a vision of human community in which justice, equality, and compassionate relationships are paramount. It is also inclusive as underlined in the covenant with Abraham. Covenant is a shared root in the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic traditions. It is the word and theoethical vision that is common to Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. The Hebrew, Greek, and Arabic words are used in the respective sacred texts. The Torah, the Gospels, and the Quran highlight and confirm the ethical aims of covenant. The three words, it has been said, drawn from three testaments, Three languages, three cultures, three eras are the bases of the internal dynamic of the three religions whose cradle lies mainly in the east in Jerusalem. Rooted above all in the mystery of God, God in all of God's self-disclosure and unknowableness, covenant is a symbiotic connection between the Abrahamic religions. Rooted also in the core ethical dimension of the covenant, an inclusive, egalitarian vision of community built on ethics of justice and social solidarity, right relations and peace. This is core identity and it is shared purpose. Half of the world's population looks to Abraham and a shared covenant. The basis for a global ethic needed not only by the human community but also by the ecological community of which the human is an integral partner. Now, in an era of globalization, there are huge challenges for justice and peace. Where Western Christendom has died and Eurocentricity has faded, where new superpowers are beginning to emerge from the East, and where economic imperialism and colonization are realities, and where majority Muslim populations protest now for democracy, rights, and justice, The Abrahamic religions have intentional work to do together. There is need to connect together with Abraham and a shared covenant, and together to turn covenantal vision into ethical praxis. And this may well be the essence of surrender to God's future, or the quest for God in concrete socio-ethical action. A third highlight in the story, Abraham and the practice of hospitality. The Hebrew Bible has a story of Abraham encountering three strangers who appear at the hottest part of the day and how in Eastern cultural tradition 
Abraham provides generous hospitality. Water is provided to wash their tired, dusty feet. A little bread is brought to provide initial refreshment, and then a feast is prepared. As they sit around eating, a conversation develops, something which food always enables. The story is a way of highlighting a future for Abraham and Sarah. There had been a covenant stretching into the future, but no heir to carry on the journey. Sarah was told that she would have a son, or at least Abraham was told that Sarah would have a son by these strangers. Sarah, meantime, has her ear to the tent wall, eavesdropping on a very male patriarchal conversation, and bursts into uncontrollable laughter when she hears the visitors say she would become pregnant at her age. Pleasure in old age. And she knows Abraham is beyond it. It's a great piece of, of Eastern storytelling. Hospitality shared becomes a moment of divine disclosure. All food is sacramental. Food shared and the conversation it evokes is an encounter with the other. Rublev's great icon of this shared hospitality story portrays the three strangers as the Christian trinity. Hugely evocative as the icon is, we might well feel uncomfortable with this Christian treatment of a Jewish story. Reading Christian theological symbolism back into a Jewish narrative may well be interpreted as supersessionism and another invitation to ethical dysfunction. But let's take it as a wonderful piece of Jewish storytelling. Abraham's hospitality becomes a moment of divine encounter and divine enclosure and yet another step into the unknowable future. The Christian Testament recognized the power of this Abrahamic story when one of its sacred letters called on the faith community to practice hospitality, and I quote, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by, by doing that some have entertained angels without knowing it. I am not suggesting there's any parallel between the hospitality I've received over the last few days, um, but you can take that text whatever way you... <laughs> whatever way you like. But the story is suggestive of an Abrahamic ecumenism, a hospitality uh, practiced in relation to each other in the Abrahamic religions. When the Quran speaks of divine revelation, it does so in largely universalistic ways. The disclosure of God in the Quran is not merely for people called Muslims as a distinctive entity. It was later scholarly development that took Ummah, community, to mean the specifically Muslim community. But in the Quran and Hadith, the collection of the Prophet's sayings, it is inclusive of the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faith communities. Ummah is also used for humanity in general, the whole human community. The Quran, it has been said, thus considers the history of Revelation as one, and connects the prophets from Adam and Noah to Jesus and Muhammad in a single chain of prophetic tradition. This acknowledgement of a common tradition not only opens up the possibility for encounter and dialogue, it suggests that dialogue is a family gathering around the table of shared hospitality. The Quran also goes beyond the Abrahamic family to the human family. Quote, O humankind, Surely we have created you from a single pair of male and female and made you into tribes and families so that you may know one another and so build mutuality and cooperative relationships, not so that you can take pride in your differences of race or social rank and breed enmities. Strangers are welcome at the table as richly diverse and sharing a common humanity before God, the all-knowing and all-aware. No one is excluded from the table. Religious superiority, communalism, sectarianism, and ethnic nationalism are all exclusive and excluding. If the Abrahamic religions make up half of the world's population, they are not superior to the other half. But they have a responsibility embedded in their Abrahamic tradition to practice an ethic of hospitality, to welcome all to the table of dialogue and experience the disclosure of the sacred other, however the sacred other may be understood. And finally, Abraham and peace building. 
Abraham has been described as a figure on the frontier, a wanderer and a man in search of God, a person in search of God. This again is the significance of the leaving Ur of the Chaldees and journeying to the unknown. Faith is not something he possesses. He rather has to live a life before God under the sign of uncertainty, a life which cannot be controlled. And part of that journey is according to Jewish Midrash and a surah from the Quran is to destroy the idols that humans are prone to create. Abraham is against idolatry, anything which replaces the ultimate loyalty to God and God's future. Leaving Ur of the Chaldees was to refuse to give ultimate loyalty to the imperial power of the day or the domination system, which like all empires and domination systems, ultimately deifies itself. This is the cutting edge of faith, living under the sign of uncertainty, because the idols still present themselves not only claiming our commitment and loyalty, but dehumanizing and destroying community. Nationalism, xenophobia, consumerism, racism, sexism, and homophobia are amongst the current gods. Abraham stripped away the masks from the deities constructed by humans in a human image. And these also include anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, all gods created from the raw materials of prejudice and ignorance and fear. But Abraham is not only involved in a battle against idolatry, according to the sacred text, but is also a peace builder. There are two stories in the Jewish book of Genesis where Abraham makes peace, one by dividing land and making a peace treaty. In Genesis 13, there is a dispute between the shepherds of Abraham and those of his nephew Lot. It's a family feud over best pasture. The fear is not enough land for all. So Abraham calls for an end to strife because they are kin. Choose left or right. And so Lot chose the Jordan Valley. A destructive conflict between kin is negotiated and resolved. The second story is even more powerful because this time the dispute is between Abraham and a Philistine, Abimelech, over a well. Water in the Near East was a big commodity, especially where herds and flocks were wealth. Abraham made a peace treaty, which included a covenant, and war was averted. The Philistine army commander returned to his own land. Now, dividing land and making peace treaties are the stuff of politics and of resonance in the contemporary world. Last year, I presented a paper at a conference in Sarajevo, Bosnia. That city still has all the scars of a brutal war in the early 1990s. Bosnia's violent war had an Abrahamic dimension. The children of Abraham became embroiled in a cruel and bloody conflict. Today, an Abrahamic council of religions is playing a key role in the reconstruction of Bosnian society and in committed work of reconciliation. Anwar Sadat remains in memory as an Abrahamic peacemaker. The then German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt was so impressed by Sadat that he wrote in his political memoir of how we are all children of Abraham. It must, he said, be possible for people once again to be made aware that they all come from the same root. Then it must be possible for them to find peace with one another. And this means in Bosnia, in Israel, Palestine, post 9 11, in a world where Abrahamic relationships are perhaps worse than they were before. It means recovering the peace ethic in the Jewish root story of Abraham himself. It is a recovery and practice of the peace ethic that can overcome the enmity between Abraham's children, enable the Abrahamic religions to shape minds and hearts towards peace, and shape peace policies and treaties. A 21st century imperative is to find a way beyond the false but dangerous perception that Islam is the enemy of the West and the West is the decadent enemy of Islam. The Abrahamic model of faith is a journey away from how things are, from injustice, oppression and violence, a shared covenant as an equality-based socio-political and economic vision, the Abrahamic ethic of radically inclusive hospitality and dialogue, 
and the peace ethic and praxis of peace building. These are, I suggest, the essence of the Abrahamic tradition. They are the reminder, too, in the 21st century that lasting peace is not possible without the religious and spiritual dimension of humanity. This may not be, not only be the missing dimension of statecraft, but too often the missing dimension of peace building. And lest the Abrahamic religions think of themselves as superior, one to the other, or towards the other religious half of the world, lest they make absolute claims for themselves, they always need to remember that Abraham was different. He is not the monopoly of any one of the three traditions. Abraham was not Jewish, nor Christian, nor Muslim. He was before all three. He is not the exclusive possession of any, but a critical friend of all. And that too, I think, has practical implications for a peace ethic and peace building. Thank you. <laughs>